I'm going to test the system. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Do you want to talk and let, let's hear if your communication back to us is a little bit better than it was last time? Now, hopefully you can hear this now. This is C.J. Bowden, Communications Officer for the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange. So far, so good. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, good morning and welcome, or good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Uh, this is the uh, properly noticed Silver State Health Insurance Exchange meeting that is being teleconferenced between here in Carson City, or I'm in Henderson now, aren't I? <laughs> Madam Chair. Here in Carson City. Madam Chair, uh, we're having trouble hearing you up here. Okay. Is that better? Much. Okay. I'll go ahead and get again, and, and we're going to start the meeting. Uh, this is a properly noticed meeting of the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange that's being teleconferenced between Henderson and Carson City offices. Um, we do have uh, web access for those that want to watch or hear the meeting, but we do not have two-way communication on telephones anymore. Uh, I don't think we have any other announcements. Are there any crimson? Uh, no announcements for me. Okay. Let's go ahead and have a roll call to make sure that we have a quorum. Ms. Campbell? Here. Ms. Atkins? Here. Ms. Johnstone? Here in Carson City. Ms. Lewis? Dr. Jamison. Ms. Kerr. Here. Ms. Kerr. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Dr. Ford. Here. Ex officio, Mr. Wilden. Commissioner Kipper. Here. Mr. Mullenkamp. And for the record, we have a quorum. All right, thank you very much. All right, we'll start into public comment. Um, I want to have a, a hand count of how many people up north and south that wish to have Public comment. We have five here in Henderson. Um, Ms. Johnstone, will you help me with the meeting uh, up in Carson City, please? I will. We have one in Carson City. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and get started here in Henderson first? And Mr. Bassich is here today. I had the opportunity of speaking with him for a few minutes before the meeting and wanted to let you go first. I know that you're little tired today and I'd, I'd like to yeah let, let's let's get you up and have your public comment I know you have some people attending with you I want to make sure that you have your public comment and you can get home and rest so if you will again identify yourself for the record and make sure that the microphones turn green uh oh hello all right. I Hello. Think, oh, I think you're on. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my last name is pronounced in many different ways, but uh, it's actual actually Basich. B a it's B a s i c h, but B a y is kind of a good way to think about it. Uh, if you're my brother, you'll say Basich. If you're a Croatian from back in Yugoslavia, you'll say Basic. But Basic is, is my name. My name is Lawrence Basich, 62-year-old retired person living here in the Summerlin area, and uh, I don't know what else to say. Is I think that's an introduction. Uh, my, my father's name is Steve. No, no, I've got a lot of Steves here. My father's name is Steve. Was Steve. 
Well, it still is Steve. He's just not alive. Okay. Um, what I wanted to say, uh, very simply, and, and I, I, I just want to say, get to the point on just a couple of things. What I wanted to say is that I feel like I, I don't necessarily represent the citizens of the state of Nevada. I'm just typical of the citizens of Nevada. That's what I feel. I feel that I'm one person who had a bad opportunity or a bad accident in that I had a heart attack on the right before the first and then had a lot of bills after that. I'd like to say to this for you, Chairwoman, is that if instead of one person had my situation, you had 118,000, as if you were predicted to have by the end of uh, March in your, uh, your rollout, 118,000 people in this, this room here, it'll be a, it would be a little tight. But I think it would also be a little bit exciting. Um, I'm glad we don't have that situation. I wouldn't wish that for anybody, what happened to me or anybody else in the state of Nevada. However, what I would like to do right now is I'd like to just address a couple of things. One has to do with, I, and I'm seeking your assistance, the board, I'm seeking your assistance on far, items on consumer protection. I mentioned this to you at the meeting, and that is that I have received my first bill asking for payment now, not just a bill saying, Hello, how are you? Here's a bill. It's a bill saying, okay, we've sent you bills before. Now will you start paying them? This is a bill for services rendered on, uh, oh, heck, I don't, I have the other, Janu yes. Jan January 10th through January 15th is when these bills occurred, and it's for about $10,000, which is not very much compared to 407, but it doesn't matter. It's the point is that I, I'll start receiving a lot of these bills. And as I mentioned to you, if, if I receive a bill and it gets to the point where a credit rating starts questioning whether or not I'm paying bills anymore, my credit rating will go down from currently my credit rating is 845. That's not too bad. I've never missed a bill in my life. I've never, never even come close to missing it. So I've got a pretty good credit rating. If I miss, if I go to a credit rating, company and they decide, well, geez, you, you're not paying your insurance bills, then I'm afraid it'll go down to 400, 200, Lord knows what. I won't be able to buy a house in the United States of America. Be kind of disappointed, uh, but you know, I'll do what I have to do after that, and I'll just have to figure that out. I want, all I wanted to do here when I came from Hawaii was to buy a house, get a dog, and go to some spring training games for the Dodgers. That's all I wanted to do, very simple. I didn't plan on the heart attack. At one of the earlier meetings, when somebody came up to me and said, oh, I don't believe you had a heart attack at all. That's just a bunch of baloney. We have a doctor here. I don't know if I, it'd be a good idea for me to show her my scars, but I would be happy to do that so that there's no, no uh, what do you call it, no confusion of the fact that I definitely had triple bypass surgery. Would you like to see them? Oh, I, you wouldn't, okay. Yes. I did, I, did I go overstep my bound already? No, I don't think anybody here on this board doubts what you have said. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, that, was one, that was one of my items for consumer protection is what do I do when I get a bill and then the credit rating gets to the point where it drops where I cannot buy a house. That's one con consumer protection item. Second consumer protection item is and please take this in the correct manner. I paid you money. I paid you money for January, February, and March, three months of payments. And right now, I think I have coverage for March, but I didn't incur any bills in March. My bills were incurred all the way from the 1st of December to the end of, ah, 1st of January to the end of January of this year. So I guess, you know, having coverage starting March 1st is like, it's worthless to me. Okay, so that's consumer protection item number two. The third one is I had, I did receive a call this week. I received several calls, one from the governor's office, Shauna. Her name is Shauna DeRussi. DeRussi, yes, I'm sorry. Shauna DeRussi called me. And I also had a call from uh, Xerox's Kevin uh, Walsh. And all I wanted to say was that as you and I spoke before the meeting, there seems to be an emphasis on on collecting telephone call information and 
comparing it with TV testimony and, and other things. And all I want is coverage on January 1st. I, I'm not saying that you're completely wasting your time by doing that, by building a record. I know I understand corporations have to do that. But all I want is coverage. I want to tell Summerlin Hospital, call, mm, call somebody else. That's all I want. The, the last point, and this, you cut me off whenever I, I, I'm appearing too ignorant, but, and I'm glad we didn't have to do our Chippendale show because you would not be in, interested in the things I have to show. And I'm not talking about the scars. Um, the, what, I'm, what I wanted to tell you is that I feel like I'm, I've only been in Nevada for a year, one year, that's it. I came here February 1st, 2013, moved here from Hawaii, was in Hawaii for 10 years, in Washington for 19 years prior to that. But I feel I'm a tip, typical Nevada. I did have a heart attack and I suffered an awful lot of pain and I don't wish that on anybody, but I feel that this, what happened to me could happen to anybody within the state and unfortunately it could happen to anybody in the state tomorrow. If it did, and instead of having one person with, oh, I'm sorry, uh, instead of having one person with a lot of bills, you may have 100,000 people with a lot of bills. I don't want the state of Nevada to look like, you know, well, geez, maybe the ball was dropped. I would, I actually want Xerox to succeed. I do. I want the state of Nevada to succeed. Because why? Ah, I'd help somebody to send my bills to. Yeah, very simple, very simple. And I, I really don't need to say anything. I had a whole bunch of things that, you know, about how wonderful I was and things that I've done in my life. But I don't think anything that's necessary. All I wanted to just point out is that I feel like I'm typical of everybody in this state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Basic. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? I wrote this out so I can just get to the point. I need to have you identify yourself for the record. Please. My name is Tamar Birch with Branch Benefit Consultants, a broker here in Las Vegas area. First, I want to acknowledge Xerox for reaching out to me to try to assist with several portal issues. Unfortunately, I have um, no results as of yet, and it's been about two weeks. I am now, sorry, I am now the broker for Mr. Basish, Basish, sorry, Lawrence. I have been in contact with Mr. Kevin Walsh, the Senior Vice President and Managing Director of Xerox regarding his case. I would like to share with the board my last communication with Mr. Walsh as to where Larry's issues stand. The email reads as this. Dear Kevin, good afternoon. Thank you for spending a few minutes with me yesterday. I still have some concerns regarding Mr. Larry Basich situation. It is my understanding that Xerox is having some legal counsel in addition to looking into recorded messages, portal access, and any other supporting documents for review and providing that information to the other interest parties that are involved. However, I find it interesting that the facts and writing provided by the applicant, which has been submitted and completed to Nevada Health Link and Xerox team, does not hold weight nor protect the applicant as such. Larry is quite distraught and running against undue stress, especially after his open heart surgery with battling an incorrect error in the Nevada Health Link portal with an effective date of 1-1. As a licensed health agent for over 16 plus years, it is inconceivable to believe a simple inquiry has taken over five months to determine which carrier will assume the risk. I have provided an email, a quick response, or a quick snapshot of concrete detailed information regarding Larry's application history that cannot be ignored. Due to inconsistencies on the portal, I have personally handled over 20 plus issues which I brought today to show these are the current issues I am currently facing that are the same or similar to Larry's application. The lack of collaboration is between Xerox and the carrier chosen. Larry is accumulating claims as we speak, yet cannot instruct these providers as to which carrier send them to that must be reconciled. The constant chaos he faces daily has caused him unjustifiable and preventable stress throughout this entire process. 
The bottom line is that the consumers who are seeking insurance through the Affordable Care Act have done their due diligence of logging into the website, completing their applications online, paying for coverage, which is deemed as a completed application. Yet consumers and brokers alike are finding themselves fighting for their coverage. Some discrepancies are effective dates reflecting incorrectly, consumer plan elections versus the lack of the portal not capturing the elected plan, eligibility determination inaccuracy, payments being cash yet not applied to an application or payments accounted for, just to name a few. The constant matter seems to be a system issue, yet people's lives are being affected. I understand that this is a huge undertaking for Xerox or any vendor who is providing an administrative service to Nevada HealthLink. However, there must take some owner, somebody must take some ownership in the accountability of a system that is not consistent in the operating features, which is causing the veterans an unusual experience of coverage. Of consultants is up for what is right and just for our clients. This email was communicated to Mr. Walsh on March 12th. Today, when the reports are presented by Xerox, please take into consideration the number of pending applications are not completed applications due to multiple applications have been forced to be recreated to a reoccurring error within the system. We at Branch Benefit Consultants are very concerned with all these issues, knowing that there are only 18 days left. The applicants that we are currently enrolling continue to encounter problems such as incorrect effective dates, cost sharing information not being submitted to the chosen carrier, the APTC falling off of billing invoices causing applicants to be billed the difference in premium. Again, these are just to me. Since applicants have to re-enroll for the next open enrollment starting November 15th, it's imperative that the Nevadans have an operational system which functions accurately to as the board makes their decisions on the direction of Nevada Health League. Please consider those like Larry being affected in this painful process. I appreciate your time. I appreciate both of your public comments, your thoughtful remarks, and I know the board appreciates it too. I hope you feel a little bit better today. Madam Chair, this is Leslie Johnstone. Um, we really. <clears throat> We need you to speak up as close to the mic as possible. Okay. Thank you. Um, next public comment here. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrick Cassell. I'm an independent broker and agent. Last week, I will say there were some successes. I was able to enroll some people. Whether they're in the system yet, I don't know, but they were enrolled successfully. And I actually enrolled two families in less than an hour, which is a plus. However, I do have clients calling me. Irene McCone was uh, one of the people I went to the news with who could not get into the system accurately. I got a call this morning saying, hey, I don't know which one of these numbers is my Hicks number. I need that to be accurately fixed. I already wrote Xerox today because they want to make a payment. They want to make sure they're paying the right account so it gets registered correctly. The other concern that I have is, it's my understanding, and hopefully I'm, in, I'm inaccurate what I'm about to say, is that the entire process has to be recreated in November. So those people that have already signed up for Nevada Health Link would have to reapply and find an application from start to finish all over again. To me, that is totally wrong because all we're doing is paying for the same real estate twice and trying to get people insured. There's gotta be a simpler format. I definitely think you can integrate things with the carriers, and most renewals work this way. You get a renewal 60 to 90 days out. You have a chance to move from a carrier at that point if you're not happy with the renewal. But our understanding is most of the fees that are being paid by the consumer will be static. The only thing that might change would be a subsidy. So it has to be on your behalf, as mentioned to HHS, that why not come up with a format that just shows what a person's projected income for 2015 will be so we don't have to start enrolling everybody again and then try to add additional people. In my honest opinion, I was shocked by all the hits on your website. I thought you guys did a tremendous job in communicating. I really believe you could have hit the 118,000 now. I didn't think it was possible earlier. I've said that to you before on the record. I believe next year we can hit 200,000 if we are accurate and get this thing up and running. The redundancy of the system is the problem. It's that simple. I mean, you have 
There's no way that Xerox can tell the consumer, we, have, we can get in and out because we know the secrets. Why not create a tutorial where the consumer can know those secrets or just imme immediately take them out of the system to speed it up? Those are the problems. And maybe we can avoid all these hassles and the navigators, the assisters and the brokers can be successful getting people into the system. And then next year and the year after and so on, we can enroll people accurately. And obviously we have our issues with Medicaid where we enter somebody into the system here and says, no, they're Medicaid eligible and Medicaid kicks them back. We have to start all over. And yet the information we indicate on the application says they're Medicaid eligible. We need more continuity and better communication across the board. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, um, Lou Silla, broker here in Nevada. And I just want to go over um, a brief situation that actually happened today that kind of relates to the gentleman's problem on a, a much smaller scale. I have a customer that I enrolled on um, February 15th uh, through uh, Anthem Blue Cross. And she sent me an email last night saying that, uh, and she, we all posted the payment date. And I'm just going to paraphrase it real quickly. I had to pay $120 for my doctor visit on March 10th. And I just got one of my prescriptions filled today, and the email is dated uh, March 12th. That was $93. So I've had to pay out over $200 out of pocket because I have no insurance cards. I called uh, Nevada Health Link this morning at 8 o'clock, explained the situation, was told by one of the customer service reps who was very helpful that the uh, information was on a February 20th uh, report. So I said, well, can you verify, you know, the date that it was sent out to the carrier because I'll call the carrier. And she said, well, we don't have that information. We have to communicate with the finance department. And the only way I have to communicate is via email, but I'll call you back. Well, it's 10 minutes to two and I have not gotten a call back. So I have a, a person who's sitting out in the wind waiting for uh, a real, and this lady works in the health insurance industry. She works for, I won't mention the name of it, but it's a foundation that helps people with uh, serious neurological diseases. So she's very familiar. She may even be a nurse. So again, uh, we've solved the problem. I've had no problems at all putting applications through since around February 18th. They've gone through with no problem. I had one that was stuck. It was an old one that dated back to uh, December, and I don't have any problem redoing that. So that problem is solved. But the connectivity to the insurance companies, and in particularly to Medicaid, I mean, I get hammered all day long with people that did it themselves, did it through a, a, a navigator, and they, I hear the same story over and over again. I'm waiting two months, I haven't heard, I haven't heard, I haven't heard. So it, it's, uh, and, it, and it's affecting the, uh, uh, the exchange because all they know is they signed up with the exchange and they don't have their finished product. So it ultimately comes back, and not necessarily the exchange's fault, but again, it's the connectivity to the, to the appropriate carrier. Other than that, all I have to say, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. One more public comment here. Two more here. Yeah. For, the rec for the record, Ted DeCourt with CARE. I want to thank the board for allowing CARE to be involved in this worthwhile project topic I'm going to talk about, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, but it, it's one of the pending items on the agenda. And it has to do with the issue of navigator organizations and their potential use during the time between open enrollments. It's clear that the residents of Nevada and the newcomers to Nevada will experience qualifying life events. These may seem small in number, yet large segments of Nevada's employees base, in particular gaming and unions, experience these qualifying events regularly as the hours these employees and members work fluctuate from eligibility in a group health insurance plan to non-eligibility. So what can navigator organizations do during these months? We work with small businesses. For care, it will be minority businesses. For employees on the shop, and the shop, the exchange shop is underutilized benefit for Nevada businesses, and navigator organizations uh, will be here to assist. What else do we do? CARE started its outreach program 
before the ACA in 2012, far uh, before the, uh, the grants were uh, granted. We set up seminars to educate business persons and community leaders about what was coming. We established relationships with the partners we would assist, who would assist us in reaching our target populations. This outreach is ongoing and vitally necessary for the success of the exchange in the coming years. What else do we do? We continue to assist the families we enrolled, many who have never had insurance, and they come to us on a daily basis with questions about the insurance system. We cannot think that because we have done all the work, all this outreach, all this advertising, that the word is out on the ACA and the exchange in Nevada. We have just begun to open doors to some of our targeted businesses. And if we stop now, these doors may close. A solution needs to be found to continue the momentum of outreach, of qualified enrollments, of helping those who, who need that. We look to the board to find a reasonable solution. A quick side note here is I do want to publicly thank AARP of Nevada, who has been not an official partner of this project, but certainly has been involved in programs that have been direct educating and directing navigator organizations. And again, I just want to thank the board and the exchange staff. We have a daunting task and to continue the that we have to continue the momentum here of enrolling and ensuring hundreds of thousands of Nevadans without insurance. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. TV Alex, for the record, with care. I just want to uh, follow up on what uh, Mr. DeCourt said in reference to the outreach. We started outreach back in 2012, and before open enrollment October 1st, 2013, we had held 53 outreach events, and we had October 1st already booked 1,876 appointments, which were serviced between October and December. Remember, October, we went through with basically almost no enrollment. What that produced was 1,599 enrollments. Had we not started outreach before October, way before that summer when we were awarded the grant, and way until we started in, in uh, 2012, I don't believe that we would have had 1,800 appointments and we wouldn't have had almost 1,600 enrollments by the end of November. So that speaks to the importance of outreaching way before open enrollment and throughout and continuing the relationships that we had already built. But my comments are, are more reference into shop. And I wanted to point out some data from um, census.gov. Nevada has approximately 1,700 black owned small businesses, approximately 17,479 owned Asian owned firms and 17,922 Hispanics-owned firms. It is unreasonable to believe that we don't have an untapped community that we can target between April and November and enroll these small businesses that are culturally and linguistically in need of people like the navigator organizations who are in the community enrolling and educating minorities, primarily on their language of choice. So I encourage you to really take consideration of this. There is nothing on the documentation that I have seen on your package for today's meetings that enforces the importance of enrolling small businesses, especially minorities, during this period between an open enrollments. And I really want you to consider that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. All right, let's go to Carson City. Johnstone, do we have somebody in Carson City? Oh. Yes, he's passing out some material. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, if you can have someone turn off the testimony microphone down in Las Vegas, that feedback should stop. 
It is off. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Sampson from Health Benefits. I'm Kevin Sampson from Health Benefits in Reno, a broker here in Northern Nevada. Uh, coming before the board now in these last few days before the end of this open enrollment period, <clears throat> uh, statements just as uh, we as brokers I know you've listened to several brokers here bringing uh, issues before the board. I know like our office, we've signed up over 300 members into the exchange from our office alone. Uh, we have other clients too that you don't hear about at all. You may be listening to several issues here, but we as brokers handle many other issues that you don't have, you don't handle at all. Uh, my point today is, and with the information that you have right there, is just to see if we in any way can help during this special enrollment period between now, excuse me, between now and the end of the year, the special enrollment period that runs between the first day of next month, tentatively, and November the 15th, from November the 15th during the next open enrollment period up through February the 15th. We would like to take an active part in that. For an example, as we look at the sister exchange in California, the Covered Cal Exchange, we do see Covered Cal has an active method to enroll their, to have their brokers completely involved in this process, especially during these last days. Covered Cal today is reaching out to all of their members through direct mail, as you will see in the flyer, through email, and through phone calls. Everyone in Covered Cal is pushing for that broker to become involved during these last days and hopefully during the entire special enrollment period that we have coming up. I will respect the three-minute call here. Uh, second issue on this one is on our website, we do, we would like to see that broker easy access to the broker on the website. That is, in California, when you look at the Covered Cal homepage, you'll see that broker prominently listed so that immediately that participant, if they choose, can choose a broker so that you may not need to see as many people here at your three-minute table as you do here today. Respect your time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in Carson City? Doesn't appear so, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Ms. Johnstone. All right. That will conclude public comment, uh, this portion of the agenda. We do have public comment before we adjourn the meeting as well. So let's move on to agenda item number three, uh, which is the approval of the minutes for February 13th, the 21st, and the 27th. Um, I'm going to take them one at a time. Uh, do we have any edits or uh, changes to the February 13th minutes? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? Marie Kerr, motion to approve. Is there a second? Dr. Ford, second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. Moving on to the minutes from February 21st. Are there any edits or changes to those minutes? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Ms. Dr. Ford, I so move. I second that motion. Thank you, uh, Drs. Ford and Jameson. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes. And lastly, February 27th, are there any changes uh, or edits to those minutes? Is there a motion to approve? Marie Kerr, motion to approve. Leslie Johnstone, all second. I think that Dr. Jamison made the motion. You might not have been able to hear her because of the microphone system here. 
And then I'll take uh, Ms. Kerr as the second on that, if everybody concurs. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. The direct those of you here in Las Vegas, uh, this is Steve Fisher, who is our uh, director. Today, let him see the facility. Some of the brokers earlier today, and so welcome to Las Vegas and to your report. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Steve Fisher, interim director of the uh, Silver State Exchange. Uh, before I get into my report, uh, first of all, I want to thank staff at the uh, exchange for all of their hard work and dedication, and specifically all their help in putting this report together. I uh, really appreciate it. First and foremost, uh, there has been a finalized regulation that I just want to cover for the board here. Um, it's a 2015 actuarial value calculator. Or cal yes, on March uh, 7th, 2014, the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, SOSIO, reposted the 2015 AV calculator to correct the deductible limit issue and to align the maximum out-of-pocket cost input check between tiers. Uh, no other changes were made to the uh, AV calculator, and it should not impact the AV calculations. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about the interim management team. Uh, we have brought in myself, interim director. We also have a, an individual who has project management experience. Her name's Sandra. And we brought in a gentleman by the name of Alan Rogers who has a really extensive background in IT. We brought them in to help with this project. And so one of the things that uh, Xerox has done is they have uh, restructured their operational side as well as their IT side. And what I mean by that is they've basically restructured it into uh, what I would call towers. So they've broken it into different functional areas. I think there's six functional areas on the operations side and there's six functional areas on the IT side. And so my goal is to put some state resources and dedicate those state resources to each one of those towers so they can participate in the meetings and so on and so forth, and then report back to me the status of how things are going in each one of those towers. And so that's my goal, to find the resources. First, I need to understand exactly what the tower is doing, you know, from a functional perspective, and then assign the correct state staff to that uh, tower. Uh, moving on, the status of the recruitment for the executive director. Uh, staff have uh, put out uh, recruitment in newspapers, the Reno Gazette Journal, the Las Vegas Review Journal, Monster.com, Insurance Journal, Facebook, Twitter. So that has been posted for the interim director or for the director's uh, position. Uh, we're also looking at um, inside health insurance exchanges to put information out there, the Nevada Hospital Association. So we're looking at all different avenues to post that recruitment. And also, uh, moving on, we also reached out to a couple of uh, recruiting agencies uh, just to see, and I just want to let the board know uh, what we found out, what staff found out. Uh, two recruiting agencies, Mercer Morgan is one recruiting agency. They're currently working on the recruitment for New Mexico. New Mexico is also looking for an executive director for their exchange. And we also reached out to Bob Murray and Associates. I uh, just want to let the, uh, the board know that there is a fee for uh, their services. Um, Mercer Morgan, uh, it's 25% of the uh, salary of the executive director would be the cost, and they want it broken out into one-third. I think they want one-third up front, and then another uh, one-third payment um, is due based on their performance and so on and so forth, and then the last uh, one-third of the payment would be due once the executive uh, director is hired. We've also reached out, as I stated, to Bob Marine Associates, and their cost is $17,500 plus expenses. I just wanted to let the board know uh, those are the two recruiting agencies that we've reached out to so far to give you an idea what the cost would be for that. 
Um, status of the website and the call center. Uh, just for the record, these numbers are will be slightly different than the numbers that Xerox is probably going to report in their uh, presentation today just because these numbers are as of 3.8. So their numbers will be uh, a little bit different. Applications uh, started last week. So those are applications with an eligibility determination. So someone's come in, they've started the application process, got an eligibility determination. Uh, as of last week, there were 16,000 applicants. Confirmed plan selections. So they've gone through, got the eligibility determination, and they've actually select, selected a plan. And I'll break this out by uh, Medicaid, 6,927 last week. CHIP, 211 last week. A QHP, 1,282 last week. And, a dent and the dental plans, uh, 1,329 last week. Enrolled, that means they, they paid. It does not include those who have scheduled a payment, but those that have paid from the QHP perspective, my number shows last week there were 322 for a total of 20,930. 20, and I know uh, Xerox's number is a little bit higher than that. Uh, moving on to website visits. You know, we, last week we had 707,000 visits to the website, uh, unique visitors to the website, 72,000. Call center, call center operations statistics. Call center last week received 11,561 calls. Uh, the average wait time, two minutes and six seconds last week. Um, average call time, almost 12 minutes, around 11 minutes and 48 seconds. And that's my uh, status of the uh, website and call center. Moving on to the status of, we have a, currently we have an audit going on. Health claim auditors are here, they're auditing Xerox. The audit period is from October 1st through December 31st. Uh, we've asked the audit team if they could also take a look at how things are currently, um, because a lot of the issues and problems that uh, they're discovering through from October through December have been resolved and fixed. So we've asked them if they could do that. That audit will be completed uh, by March 24th. And then the findings will be reported to the board. Marketing and outreach, obviously we're continuing uh, both marketing and out outreach through the end of this month. From an outreach perspective, uh, we're doing home and student visits, school-based outreach, door-to-door -door canvassing, ongoing material distribution. As of March 11th, uh, we've had a total, just over a million touch points to date. 461, almost 462,000 uh, were, gar were garnered through door-to-door -door campaigns. In addition, KPS3 and the Ramirez Group, they'll be supporting the Ramirez Group. They will be hosting an enrollment fair on the 29th of the month from 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 p.m. down here in the Las Vegas area at the Cashman Center. There will also be one in the north at the Truckee Meadows Community College from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And that's an enrollment fair. Advertising. The advertising media will uh, continue to run through the end of this month, including you know TV spots, radio, home, digital, online banners, ads, so on and so forth. Uh, the current messaging includes the March 31st deadline as a prominent call to action. And you know, without going into, let's see, any specific details within advertising, um, that pretty much wraps up my executive director report.
board have any questions for me? Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Let's open it up for questions. Um, let's start in Carson City. Any questions from board members or ex officio board members uh, for Mr. Fisher? Marie Kerr here. Um, just one question, Mr. Fisher, and thank you for doing that. Um, does the synopsis of the audit of the current status include an audit of the time period January through March of 2014? Um, as I'm listening today, it would appear that um, some of the issues regarding the cards being issued, insurance cards being issued to person to consumers occurred from January through mid-February. Um, and if the synopsis and the audit does not um, include that time period, I would request that you do and to include that time period. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I will. Um, I will make sure that that time period gets included. Any other questions? Madam Chair Lynn Atkins, um, for the record. First of all, I just wanted to thank Mr. Fisher very much for stepping up um, and helping us out uh, during this time. So um, we look forward to working with you, and thank you for being there. Um, secondly, I have two questions. One is about the audit as well, um, as Ms. Kerr was asking. Who, I don't recall, is this an audit that we are internally doing that we've hired an outside agency or is this a federally mandated audit or the feds coming in? Like what, what is, can you give a little bit more background if you know and if you don't know if someone up uh, in Carson City has the answer to that audit question? So for the record, Damon Haycock, Finance and Research Officer. This audit is uh, part of our audit protocols. We, uh, uh, if you remember, the board approved the audit protocols to do a business operations solutions vendor audit and that we were going to do an initial audit over the first half of open enrollment in hopes of determining what situations required additional uh, insight and additional changes. Uh, in, in the end, it looks like we're going to be able to receive this information, obviously, after the initial open enrollment. But the, the, the plan was to just grab the first three months, Ms. Ekins. Thank you. So this is just one of our own internal, basically our own internal audit that we've hired an outside agency. Uh, yes, that is correct. Thank you very much. Um, I just have one other question. Um, I know it's in the report and we had asked at the last board meeting last week about um, possible recruiting agencies and recruiting companies. I don't know if this is an op a time to discuss that. I don't, I see it's not an action item, so I don't know if any of the board members have any thoughts on this, if we think it's a good idea to do, if we don't. Again, I don't I don't know that I have a particular opinion on it, but it would seem to be um, an item for board discussion. Mr. Belcourt. Um, Madam Chair, Dennis Belcourt. Uh, it is not an action item, but you can discuss it, certainly. Thank you. So I guess I'm just posing the question to my fellow board members. I don't know um, what people's thoughts are on um, hiring a recruiting agency or not. and. My question would be, has staff um, ascertained whether or not this agency... Madam Chair, if you can speak into the microphone. Thank you. I, I, I know what you're talking about. I do that all the time when I'm up north. Um, do we know whether or not we can hire a recruiting agency under statute? I think that was one of the questions before. Are, are we allowed to pay for those types of services? So, Madam Chair, Damon Haycock, for the record, uh, unfortunately, I do not have that piece of information for you today, but I can find out probably within 15 minutes at the end of this board meeting. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, this is Ms. Johnstone. Leslie Johnstone. Um, as one board member, I think it would be very helpful to bring in a uh, recruitment agency. This is a tough job. Uh, I think we're going to have to <clears throat> go above and beyond our normal recruitment process in order to uh, recruit and uh, meet with potential candidates. So I think because of the nature of the job, we need to uh, do something uh, outside of the norm. Any other comments from board members? This is Marie Kerr. Oh, 
Dr. Jameson, and then I'll come back to you, Ms. Kirk. Uh, Madam Chairman, I would uh, agree and echo that. And so I think if we find out uh, after this meeting whether it's possible uh, that we're allowed to do that, then we make it for an uh, action item next meeting since we won't be able to do anything this time. Ms. Kerr? Uh, I, I actually, um, it's a little redundant of what Dr. Jamison just said, and I do agree with both Dr. Jamison and Ms. Johnstone. Okay, I think staff has heard the comments, so, yes. For the record, uh, Steve Fisher. Also, I think because of the dollar amount, it's over $10,000, I just want to let the board know that I believe we'd have to do a contract with uh, this recruiting agency. And also, we would probably have to get approval for that contract through the Board of Examiners. I'm just trying to give you the, the process that we would have to go through in order to make that happen, just so you know it's, uh, it'll take a little bit of time to, to make that happen. Marie Kerr. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Marie. It's, is it possible to do um, two different contracts? Like, I, I think the, it's the 99.99 contracts. Can you do two different ones? Or would you have to put it all in one? I think I'll take that for the record, Damon Haycock, uh, finance research officer. Uh, you could do separate contracts for separate vendors, but if you split a contract to one vendor, it's considered circumventing. Lynn Atkins, for the record, I, I would ask then um, and that at our next board meeting we have maybe the two proposals and any other proposals if we can find out, uh, if staff can find out, Mr. Haycock said he could find out after the meeting that we could enter into a contract to do that. I would ask that all of this information be provided to the board at our next meeting and that it be an action item. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions for the executive director? I had a question. Dr. Jamison? It was on the audit. It was uh, pertaining to the questions already addressed. Uh, you were gonna find out if it included the other time period. I was just curious, do you know right now what time period it does cover? Uh, yes, for the record, Steve Fisher, it's October through December. Mm -hmm. And w was this, at our last board meeting, we talked about an external audit being done? And this is that audit we spoke about? No, I didn't think so. But this is just then a different audit, and that's why you were clarifying it. This is an audit, an internal audit. So it's not the one that we were speaking about before. For the record, yes, this is an internal audit. And yes, the other one would be considered an assessment, not an audit. I think it's the one you're referring to, that's the last board meeting. Any other questions from board members? Then I, uh, there was an item that was brought up last meeting, and I think this would be the appropriate time to talk about it, and that is um, the review process for the selection once we start getting applications. And we asked uh, Mr. Belcourt to help us with that so that we understood what was subject to the open meeting law and what would not be subject to the open meeting law. So I would ask Mr. Belcourt if he could address that for us today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dennis Belcourt, Deputy Attorney General. <clears throat> the, um, went back and checked the books again. And the, the requirement is not just in, the general requirement for uh, public bodies is if they create a subcommittee within the, their statutory authority that that subcommittee has to observe the open meeting law. Uh, this particular body has a very particular statute that reaffirms that. It's very specific that you, uh, that a, a committee to, to uh, carry out the functions of the, the body would have to, uh, as a subcommittee, would have to uh, observe the open meeting law. How, <clears throat> on the other hand, if the this body chooses an individual to do the screening, that individual is not a uh, not a committee, subcommittee, or advisory committee. That individual would could uh, you know deliberate with him or herself uh, without holding a public meeting. Uh, that individual could also uh, is not prohibited from talking to others. Uh, however, the product that individual brings back would be that individual coming for, forward to this board and saying, "Here's my recommendations of a slate that you can consider, say, for interviews." 
So if you have an individual doing that, that individual would not be prohibited from talking to other persons about um, resumes that came in. There, there is one limitation to that. Uh, you cannot have a quorum of this body in those discussions. So if that individual talks to other people, uh, then he or she can't, you know, pick um, four board members to discuss it with. Uh, so that's that's a limitation on that. Thank you. Madam Chair, Lynn Atkins for the record. I think that probably highlights maybe the need for a recruiter. I mean, it sounds like it might be the best of all worlds to hire a recruiter who's experienced in this field, have that person vet, review, meet with potential candidates, and then the top two, three, five, whatever it is, get then submitted to the board for interviews. I mean, I think that that just is starting to make sense to me as, as a procedure, so I just wanted to say that. Marie Kerr, how long would it take to get um, a contract approved? And that's for Mr. Haycock. For the record, Damon Haycock, uh, the contract approval between uh, 2000 and 50000 is a uh, clerk of the board. So it is as quickly as we can develop a scope of work and have the contractor sign and then clear it through our deputy attorney general and then signed off by the clerk of the board at the budget office. Potentially, it could be a couple weeks. process down and then if we are able to legally and affordably get a recruiting team really incorporate that in but I, I still think the process needs to move forward we're starting to get applications already so uh, dr. Jamison um, madam chair I would feel very comfortable with that I think you are the most experienced person and I would feel comfortable for you to do that and I would move that we Oh, we're not allowed to do that. It's not an action item. Right. But I would agree uh, with that trend, the way we're going. Okay. Any other comments from board members? All right. This is, this is Dr. Ford. I, I just wanted to mention I would like to see the recruiting plans um, in a more detailed way, not just a dollar amount, but their plans if we're trying to decide between vendors. Right. And I think it's important, too, because um, one of the – Vendors came back with 25%, and the other one was 17,000, but it was heavy on the extent side, so it looked like they were both almost the same. So we need to look at whatever the fee is and then estimate expenses. The expenses could make a big difference. Madam Chair? Yes, this Johnstone. Leslie Johnstone. Um, it might be a good idea if uh, staff establishes a deadline for recruitment firms to submit their proposal. I can't imagine we're limited to the two that we've received so far. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, Mr. Fisher, thank you for your first lengthy report. Much appreciated. I apologize. I have uh, one comment. Oh, please, go ahead. Uh, with all of the advertising we're going to put out for the executive and have put out for a new executive director, will how will that... Uh, work once a recruiter, if they are hired, is hired, do we then uh, have to, with their contract, no longer put out advertisements? For the record, Damon Haycock, uh, it depends on the, spe the specifics of that contract, and I think I just talked over somebody, so I'll stop. All right. Well, I think that you have enough information on what our questions are going to be. So at the time that you agendize this, I, I think you'll have all that information ready for us. Any other questions uh, for Mr. Fisher? Okay. There being none, um, we're going to let's close that agenda item. And I've had a request that we move um, to agenda item number seven before we go to agenda item number five.
Madam Chair Lynn Atkins, I, I just thought that the, depending upon what happens with item seven, that might affect the discussion on agenda item five. So it's just seemed premature to talk about the enrollment in sisters until we have the discussion about um, a potential special enrollment session. All right, thank you. I, I, I think that makes sense. Any objections from board members? All right. And who is going to lead the discussion on this item? Uh, Madam Chair, Damon Haycock for the record. I will be giving the report on a extending open enrollment and special enrollment periods. So I'll go ahead and begin. I want to first frame this, uh, this report. I, I want to make sure everybody understands that what is being presented to the board and the public today is not a deviation from the federal mandate to provide special enrollment periods as outlined in 45 CFR 155.420. I'll go over that a little bit in, inside the report later, but what is presented to the, to the board and the public is if the board wishes to declare a basically a blanket special enrollment period because of specific circumstances stemming from the technological issues that consumers are having enrolling in health insurance on Nevada Health Link. So this in no way is circumventing the federal law that requires that all exchanges must allow for special enrollment periods if qualifying life events exist or if uh, any special triggering events occur where a consumer can request and we must provide them the ability to choose or change a qualified health plan. Additionally, the background to this report is that staff was asked to investigate a uh, potential ability to extend open enrollment based on some information received that another state-based exchange uh, in Massachusetts was afforded the opportunity to extend their open enrollment. We contacted the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, i.e. CMS, and asked them if, uh, if we were able to have the same capabilities. And they responded that no, there is no way to extend open enrollment and pointed us to, needless to say, the Code of Federal Regulations that describes special enrollment periods. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, go into the actual report. 45 CFR 155.420, of course, describes how people, uh, excuse me, how the process for a special enrollment period exists. That again, I will stress, we must provide special enrollment periods uh, so that individuals or qualified individuals can enroll in qualified health plans, or they may change them. Uh, what's uh, very important is the effective dates of coverage. There are the regular effective dates, much uh, like they are today for open enrollment, where if they enroll in the first 15 days of the month, they get a first of the following month effective date of coverage. If they enroll in the last 15 days or from the 16th to the 31st, they enroll, their effective dates of enrollment is the first of the month following the next month. Uh, and so uh, basically, if you were to enroll on March 15th, you have an April 1 enrollment date. If you enroll between March 15th and April 15th, uh, excuse me, yeah, in April 15th, you would have a May start date. So those are the standard effective dates of coverage, and that'll be important later on into this report. There's also special effective dates. Those are outlined in the same uh, regulation, and they go over birth, adoption, and foster care, and that is the date of the event, marriage, the first of the month following the event, loss of minimum essential coverage, the first of the month following event, and here the last part is what's going to be applicable to what we're talking about today, Non-enrollment in a QHP is unintentional if a QHP violated the contract, which is not part of the discussion, or other exceptional circumstances, and all of those have the date of the event. Additionally, and you have attached to this report in the attachment uh, 7A CMS guidance on exceptional circumstances, that uh, CMS issued guidance on February 27th of this year, uh, basically describing the definition of what they, they are guiding as the definition of an of a exceptional circumstance and how the process works when you implement that, that definition. So to try to paraphrase and summarize, if it's due to technical issues, uh, enrolling qualified individuals in a qualified health plan during the initial open enrollment period, such a circumstance may be considered an exceptional circumstance. They further de describe that the marketplace may allow for coverage retroactive to the date on which coverage would have been effective absent the exceptional circumstance described above, and that is going to be very important later on in this report. 
CMS finally finishes off uh, in their guidance with an example that an effective enrollment date based on the date that the individual originally submitted an application for coverage to the marketplace. And so our staff research and interpretation of this guidance is that if they applied for coverage in, before January 1, uh, before actually December 15th uh, of last year, then the effective date of coverage would utilize that application date to determine when the, uh, the next available uh, effective date of coverage would be. So the first decision that has to be weighted and discussed is actually declaring a special enrollment period. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this report, this is not in any way to, to circumvent the standard special enrollment period information that is, excuse me, exists in regulation today. So what the board may decide that the issues surrounding that the inability to enroll in a qualified health plan on Nevada HealthLink could constitute one of the following two situations that the qualified individuals or his or her dependents enrollment or non-enrollment in a QHP is unintentional, inadvertent, or erroneous, and as a result of the error, misrepresentation, or inaction of an officer, employee, or agent of the exchange, or HHS, or its instrumentalities as evaluated and determined by the exchange. Long story short, if we have made a mistake in our abilities to enroll people in a qualified health plan, you can use that, uh, that reason. Secondly, the qualified individual or enrollee or his or her dependent demonstrates to the exchange in accordance with guidelines issued by HHS that the individual meets other exceptional circumstances as the exchange may provide. And that reason directly ties into the, uh, the guidance that was released on February 27th defining an exceptional circumstance. So if the board would like to declare a special enrollment period for these individuals, the declaration can occur honestly at any time uh, between now and March 31st. The actual special enrollment period can begin immediately and at any time between now and up to 60 days after the declaration date. So the special enrollment period can only be for 60 days. That is in regulation. And the date of declaration, therefore, is critical. The board would then need to decide the reasons for the special enrollment period and its effective date of coverage based on the declaration of the, the actual special enrollment period itself. So like every report, we provide pros and cons to this process. So if the board declares an exchange special enrollment period, it will allow all consumers with the same circumstance, such as could not enroll due to technical issues, the same period of time to finalize their enrollment. And this process can expedite the results by eliminating the need for individual requests for special enrollment periods for the same stated issues. So it's basically lumping this entire population together that has the exact same issue and providing them a start date and an end date to finalize enrollment in a qualified health plan beyond the initial open enrollment date. Now on the flip side as cons, if the system is still experiencing major tech difficulties, then the expected level of enrollment during a special enrollment period will be very low. This may result in a lack of return on investment and a waste of current resources at the expense of future fixes. Additionally, a retroactive blanket special enrollment may disrupt the risk pool and cause filed and approved rates for 2014, both on and off the exchange, to be insufficient. And finally, a 60-day blanket special enrollment period will delay the insurer's ability to evaluate their risk pools and projected loss experience for 2015 delaying the 2015 implementation timeline by the exchange and the Nevada Division of Insurance and or jeopardizing the willingness of insurers to participate in 2015. And I know I just said quite a mouthful, so I'll try to explain it as best I can. And hopefully at the end of this report, if I, if I make any errors in judgment, uh, Scott Kipper from the Division of Insurance can correct me. But basically, when the insurance companies developed their rates for 2014, they decided on, on the amount of risk that they were willing to take, and they developed their rates accordingly. And that risk had a time factor associated with it. And so if the open enrollment period is from October through March, they determined how much risk they were willing to take, and then they costed their, their plans accordingly. Had they known that we were going to have any additional extension of time, which would allow additional members to enter into the market, uh, they may have adjusted their rates differently, which may have changed the entire uh, health of the marketplace. Additionally, uh, right now, uh, these uh, insurance carriers are looking at how they're going to develop plans and rates for next year. And they are taking all of the data that they've received over the last almost six months to determine what is the appropriate rates to submit to the Nevada Division of Insurance. 
And that rate submitting process is on a very tight timeline to ensure that all plans are tested and are in place and displayed by next open enrollment. We have already met with the Nevada Division of Insurance and discussed the timeline to ensure that uh, as partners, we can and have the best products and the best process in place for these insurance carriers to display their plans in November of this year. Any deviation from that timeline then pushes that critical path out, and then we, we could potentially run into a situation where we are trying to approve plans and display plans and test plans while we are starting up open enrollment, and that is nothing that no one actually wants that to occur this year. So that's declaring a special enrollment period. That's the first decision that we believe the board needs to, needs to make. So there are two options if the board decides that they wish to declare a special enrollment period. The first is to use the non-enrollment due to error reason that I mentioned earlier. So individuals have been given the opportunity to enroll in a qualified health plan on Nevada Health Link during the, our course mandated open enrollment period. For these individuals who cannot finalize enrollment, a 60-day special enrollment period can be offered beginning as late as April 1st, 2014 and ending May 30th, 2014, again, those 60 days. This special enrollment period would only be offered to individuals who can demonstrate they started the application process prior to March 31st and could not enroll in a qualified health plan. The effective date of coverage would follow the regular effective dates outlined in regulation, so those between the 1st and the 15th of the month, the exchange would ensure a coverage date on the first day of the following month, and those from the 16th to the last day of the month would ensure a coverage effective date of the first day of the second following month. So as I mentioned earlier as an example, those who enrolled in a QHP by April 15th would have a May 1 start date. Those between April 16th and May 15th would have a June 1 start date. And finally, individuals enrolling between May 16th and May 30th would have a July 1 start date. So as you can see, there's some time lag based on the, the actual regulation and how it is explained uh, in law. So what are the pros of this, uh, this opportunity or this process? Utilizing a prospective effective date of enrollment would minimize adverse selection. This process can eliminate the chance for an individual who knowingly quit the application process with no intention of finalizing enrollment to come back after experiencing an unplanned medical event and choose a rich health plan such as a platinum plan to lower their out-of-pocket costs. It can also ensure that the carriers are not liable for claims that have occurred in the past. The cons of this, of course, is if an individual truly tried to enroll with every intention of making premium payments since January, this individual may be liable for previous medical claims that our system was supposed to provide relief for by allowing appropriate and timely enrollment. Option two is utilizing that exceptional circumstance reason. Individuals, of course, have been battling our web portal on Nevada Health Link since October of last year, and they continue to try and enroll every day as you, as you hear from public comment weekly here at our board meetings. There are still errors and glitches that prevent them from finalizing enrollment that they selected sometimes even months ago. Furthermore, many individuals have, of course, a desperate need to receive medical attention and are accumulating medical debt that was supposed to be shared by insurance carriers if they could just get enrolled. So for these individuals who cannot finalize enrollment, again, a 60-day special enrollment period can be offered between as late as April 1, 2014 through May 30th of this year. And this special enrollment period, again, would only be offered to individuals who can demonstrate they started the application process prior to March 31st and could not enroll in a qualified health plan. The effective dates for these individuals, if you follow CMS guidance came out on the 27th of February, would be the date that they applied. And so this means that a retroactive effective date of coverage could possibly reach all the way back to January 1 of this year. So what are the pros of this option? Individuals who have tried to enroll on, a Nevada, on Nevada Health Link could receive an effective date of coverage appropriate to their application. Those with medical claims since that application date will receive financial relief per the cost-sharing provisions of the plan they select. The advanced premium tax credit and cost-sharing reductions per CMS guidance will still be provided to the carrier from the U.S. Treasury, retroactive all the way back to the first effective date of coverage. Here are the cons to this process. Individuals with no intention of finalizing enrollment, regardless of the technical issues, now have an avenue to enroll as long as they start that application. So some of those individuals may have experienced a traumatic event 
and now they need expensive coverage. This process allows them to pick a plan similar to a platinum plan, and the high costs now of this medical care are borne by the carrier. This situation can definitely lead to adverse selection in the marketplace. So these are just two options, and as we've uh, heard over the last few weeks and presented different reports to the board, sometimes a hybrid of options is better or sometimes a completely different option is more appropriate. But utilizing these two avenues, uh, we feel that the board has an opportunity and an option to choose if they want to provide this special blanket uh, enrollment period. The board can, on the inverse, decide that they would rather follow the, the code as it is written and allow every individual who feels that they have a qualified life event or a triggering event to go through the standard processes to receive a special enrollment period. And those that have a, a problem with the decision that we've provided them, either in eligibility or, or enrollment, uh, can always appeal. So uh, exchange decisions can be appealed. So there, there again are some options. So we recommend as staff to the board that the board decide if they wish to declare a special enrollment period, and we mean a blanket special enrollment period, after open enrollment ends, and if the board decides to declare a special enrollment period, to also decide on the type of triggering event, either option one or two, or some form of hybrid, that determines effective dates of coverage for that special enrollment period. Uh, with that, I am willing to take any questions about this report. Mr. Haycock, I'm going to open it up for discussion among board members. Um, yes, Dr. Uh, Jameson. Madam Chairman, I know one of the concerns with our insurance companies that have been so wonderful about being available to this project is the low numbers uh, that they had. So I would really be interested if there's any representative of a company here that could speak to how they feel about how it might impact them before making such a decision. Does the board object to having public comment from those carriers at all? I'm not hearing any. I don't, I don't know if we have any of the carriers present in Carson City or here in Las Vegas. I do have a letter from the Nevada Association of Health Plans, which I... Madam Chair, could you speak into the microphone? Are there any carriers in Carson City? Uh, Doesn't appear so. Exchange. How about here in Las or Henderson? I do have a letter that was sent to me, and I noticed that it was not attended to our public comments, which is... Madam Chair, your mic has just cut out. I'm going to try a different one. Does that seem to be a bit better? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have a letter from the Nevada Association of Health Plans, uh, which is the association that represents the carriers, and I'm pretty sure that the carriers that are in the exchange are members of this health plan. But let me read it into the record, and it, it's about, uh, it was dated actually today, uh, and we will get this posted on our website. Um, I'll, I'll send it down or link it to uh, one of our staff in Carson. Um, and it says, it is our understanding that the exchange board will be discussing an extension to the open enrollment for the individual exchange. It is our understanding that it would have to be a special enrollment instead of a continuation of the existing open enrollment period. Additionally, it is our understanding that a special enrollment period would be limited to individuals who attempted to enroll but were unable to enroll through the exchange due to special circumstances. NAHP believes that it believes it is the long-term best interest of the Silver State Exchange consumers and the carriers to end the open enrollment as planned on March 31st. If the board believes a special enrollment period is warranted, we believe having a structure around the determinations for eligibility to be established for that enrollment period. Additionally, we recommend a special enrollment period end on April 30th, 2014, in an effort to give the vendor and uh, the exchange staff adequate time to fix existing enrollment and 
enrollment and issues in order to be prepared for the 2015 enrollment period. If the board determines a special enrollment period is warranted, we will continue to work diligently to do our part to effectuate membership as correct and timely information is delivered to us. And that's the end of the, uh, that's the end of the statement. And I will send this on to uh, our executive assistant and have that later today or at the latest tomorrow. So I don't. Madam Chair, your mic cut out. Going for the third time here. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't believe we have carriers um, in either location, so I think we'll just have to carry on the dialogue without them. Better as their statement. Any questions in or comments in Carson City? Madam Chairman, for the record, Scott Kipper, if I might. Yes, uh, Commissioner Kipper. Well, I, first of all, I think uh, uh, I want to uh, commend Damon. I laid out very uh, succinctly uh, a kind of a difficult uh, conundrum here for the board. You have basically three choices uh, to make. I wanted to talk a little bit about rates and rate setting because although he, he touched on that, I think it deserves a little bit of a deeper dive. Uh, certainly when, when the individual carriers created their rates that we see today, they looked actuarially at what they anticipated those claims to be. They based that on uh, prior claim information for the general population of what they and who they anticipated would be purchasing those products. Going forward for 2015, they're going to base their projections in those rates based on the claims experience uh, and, and the anticipated new enrollees uh, for the 2015 pools. The problem that uh, faces carriers if you put a, a, a special enrollment period in is you're now going to push down the road another 60 days uh, for those carriers to evaluate uh, uh, the, the data. But that does, as, as Damon mentioned, does shorten up that period for them to create new rates uh, and and get them filed, get them approved, and get them ready for uh, open enrollment. We have a um, a standing meeting on Wednesdays between the DOI staff and the exchange staff, and this was a very much a topic of discussion yesterday as our timelines went. And and we, without a a um, special enrollment period, are facing some very tight timelines in the development of new products. A review of and approval of existing products, and then the review of those rates. So that's going to be, I think, a real challenge. Uh, the issue, the other issue that that Damon brought up was the adverse selection uh, piece. And if a an individual attempted to purchase, uh, certainly they should have, I think, an opportunity to finish that process if the inner was due to a technical problem. The problem, from what I understand, is finding out when that date was, when they last uh, attempted to uh, uh, sign up for a product, and how do we go forward with that. And then the, the other question that faces the board is whether you do a retroactive uh, back to the earliest effective date, if they attempted to sign up in December or November for a January 1st uh, date, or subsequent to that uh, as outlined in option one. But I think you did a very succinct job of laying out those options and what those uh, uh, decision points are going to be for the board. Thank you, Commissioner Kipper. We have any comments here? Ms. Atkins? Madam Chair, Lynn Atkins for the record. Mr. Kipper, um, I, a question about the rating. Did, did the carriers take into consideration the projections of the 118,000 during the first open enrollment, or was that not part of this discussion? And if so, I don't know. I don't know really where where that matters. I guess so. Uh, for the record, Scott Kipper, and I think that's a great question. I would, in, in not looking at 
each individual uh, uh, rate filing. Uh, it, it would be my uh, guess, uh, guess is kind of a, it'd be my uh, uh, educated guess that they did take into that account, into account the, the, the depth of the 118,000 and not the 20 to 30,000 that we're looking at. Thank you very much. I have a couple other questions and I'm not sure who, who wants to answer. Um, I, I guess if, if we were to decide to do this, it looks like we've got 345,000 people that had started applications, and I'm assuming we take off the 20,000. I'm just doing round numbers for purposes of discussion. So, if one of the open, if one of the special enrollment pieces was people who have start who have started their applications, you're now talking about 325,000 people who are potentially in that pool. If you're talking about people who have already had eligibility determinations, that number is about 300,000. Again, take. person trying to get the insurance. These people seem to be having a very difficult time getting anything done. Uh, not because it's their fault, because they can't get in the system, they can't get on the phone, they can't talk to somebody, they're having their brokers and navigators trying to help them. And is this going to create another, you know, 200, 300,000 people that are in the system that now need documentation and proof of everything that they've tried and they have to call the 800 number, or they have to get someone to help them to do this. So I don't know how all of that would work. Again, I want as many people to get insurance as possible now. I don't know that this doesn't sound like it's going to be messy, though. I guess my comment back would be what hasn't been messy so far, <laughs> you know? Uh Madam Chair, your mic cut out. All right, how about that? All right, okay. I have very strong feelings about having a special enrollment for several reasons. One is our purpose is to get people enrolled and we have failed the Nevada citizens that have attempted to enroll through the health insurance exchange. I think it's our responsibility to those people to give them every avenue that they can, whether it be 30 days or 60 days, to finish a process that they started. Um, Xerox tells us that they're going to have all of the fixes done by March 31st. If we don't have a special enrollment, we'll never know if that promise is met or unmet. I don't want to get into the fall new open enrollment for 2015 and find that we fall on our face again. And I think a special enrollment with very tight parameters, and I would look to Commissioner Kipper to help develop those parameters so that we don't create adverse selection. I think uh, it, my feeling as a board member is I would like to give Nevada citizens that opportunity and I'd also like to give Xerox the opportunity of proving that they can fix it by March 31st. Madam Chair, Dr. Ford for the record. Uh, my concern, I'm just going to uh, add to what Ms. Edkin said, is at what point in the process would these people be eligible? Um, because there are so many who got through step one. So I would be very concerned as to at what point in the process they would be eligible. And my second question is um, for, for Commissioner Kipper is using this retroactive concept, uh, how would that affect the timeline of the rates? I fear that it would make it very difficult for the insurance companies to set rates. Madam Chair, for the, uh, for the record, Scott Kipper, uh, in, in, to address Dr. Ford's question, I think if it was a retroactive enrollment back to the, to the earliest enrollment uh, effective date for those individuals, I think that would be a, uh, a significant challenge for uh, carriers to uh, not only 
uh, manage those claims, but also to set rates going forward. Uh, I just think that that would be a, a real challenging task, perhaps Herculean in, in, its, in its effect. Well, and let me make my position clear. I'm talking about effective dates going forward. Unless there is someone that can prove they made a payment and continue to make payments, that would be the only way that I would see a January 1st effective date. Other than that, it would be those people that tried, were stopped, got frustrated, and can document and are willing to pay in that special enrollment period for forward uh, coverage. Just the usual budget question. There was a comment when it was presented about the additional burden to the budget. Are, are we okay with that? So for the record, uh, Damon Haycock, the budget will adjust uh, to the amount of enrollees. The more enrollees we have, the better our budget looks. Keep that as a standard. Marie Kerr, I would be in favor of an approach, um, the, uh, the hybrid approach we just heard Barbara state, um, the special enrollment um, with, time, with the effective date going forward, unless somebody can prove you have a special circumstance um, where the person can prove they made payment, because if they made payment, they should certainly get an insurance card and have coverage. Um, so that would be my favorite approach. Madam Chair, um, Ms. Kerr, I would be interested in your thoughts and anyone's thoughts. So what, which group of people um, are people thinking about? Are, are we thinking about the people that started the application, made eligibility, uh, had eligibility determinations? Which, which group are we discussing? And is there a way in the system technologically that that gets figured out? I mean, would the system... If, if we decided that it was people who had eligibility determinations, how is it that they could get in the system, update and finish their application versus the people who had started the application? Would the system kick them out and not allow them to? How, how, how is this going to work? Well, it, that's why I asked uh, that we have. Madam Chair, your microphone cut out. Again, can okay now? Yes. Okay. The area of expertise region of insurance. Madam Chair, if you Madam Chair, if you look forward, it seems to work better. Okay. Well, maybe we. It cut out again. <laughs> okay. The area of expertise on putting those tight parameters around. It cut out. <laughs> Looks like we've got a graveyard of, of speakers here. Setting tight parameters around a special moment, I think we really need a lot of guidance from Commissioner Kipper. There it went again. You still, okay. I hear it stop. I'm going to repeat myself. Um, numbers that are on the executive director's report that shows confirmed plan selections applications started. I think those numbers are accurate, but I think they're duplicates and there's triplicates and there's some people that have gone in 10 and 12 times that have multitude of different Hicks numbers. So I don't think the volume there should be taken as a one-on-one -on -one potential. Um, my concern and what I really want to do is make sure that the system works, that Xerox provides the March 31st fix to everything, and that those Nevada citizens that have tried and been unable to get through the system are afforded 
an additional opportunity with those tight parameters from Commissioner Kipper, I, I, I have very strong feelings about letting those people have access to health insurance. Madam, Madam Chair, Chair. I agree with every, if I could just really quickly, and I know I'm taking too much time probably, I agree with everything you're saying. I'm just saying the technology has to be able to support whatever these decisions are. So let's just say the decisions are people just with the last name of A get to go into the system and do it, and that's the special enrollment group. The system needs to be able to say, aha, your last name is A, you fall within this group. If your last name is not A, do you have a qualifying life event? Is there some other reason you're here? And able to even just do that screening. I don't, so, so I agree with what you're saying. I don't see how the technology is going to be able to make whatever determinations we decide are that special enrollment group. Madam Chair, this is Leslie Johnstone. I think yes. your mic is cut out. <laughs> um, I have a couple of okay. questions. Did I hear the discussion correctly that we could uh, choose a special enrollment period less than 60 days? For the record, Damon Haycock, uh, all of the research that staff have looked into special enrollment periods state that they uh, need to be 60 days, but I will check right now on my handy dandy iPad to see if it's up to or exactly. Okay, and then my next question is, did I hear it correctly that we cannot tell the last date somebody attempted to complete their application and enrollment? If the board does not object, we have Xerox here, and I would like to ask Greg to come forward. It's my understanding that our system can tell us when somebody tried to apply and how far they got in the system, but let's have Xerox quantify that for us, please. Yeah, I know, I've, uh, I've been being taught this each week. <laughs> So um, again, my name is Greg Vidiello uh, from Xerox for the record. Um, and just to repeat the question, I want to make sure that I answer the correct question. Do you have the availability of checking within the system to know if a person tried to enroll and when they tried to enroll and if they got blocked? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, and actually how we've been able to run some of the reports even to have some of the additional outreach campaigns uh, that is based on figuring out where people um, got stuck in the system, per se, or had problems. So we're able to run reports for each of those, and that's how we've done some of our targeted outreach now. Thank you. Madam Chair, my question went a little bit different. Can you tell the last date they attempted and where they got the date that they got stuck? I will have to uh, actually go back and, and check that for you. And um, if, if OK, I would like to respond to you via uh, email this evening. Would that be a possibility? Well, I think the board needs to make a decision today. And this question may be important to those members. Lynn Atkins, for the record. I guess I'll just ask the question that we talked about here. If we declare a special enrollment period, and again, I'm just using for for example, for people with the last name that begins with an A, how is it that when somebody with the last name of B goes into the system, it would either kick them out or tell them that they cannot go forward with the application process unless they have a qualifying event? Is that something that is just a mouse click away? Is that something that has to be developed and designed? Because I'm assuming whatever we decide, it would have to be implemented on April 1st. So aside from the entire system needing to be working the way it should be working anyway, this to me is a whole nother level of technology challenges. And so I don't see how that could get implemented by April 1st. I would love it if it could, but. So I, what I'll say is that the system is not necessarily designed in the question that you're asking. However, um, the data is available in the system, and it's a case of us 
designing a report to get that information in order to go after those targeted folks. So let's use your example if you want to go after all the individuals you know, whose name begins with A and who are in the system, we could run a report uh, and find out what the status of all those individuals are from an eligibility standpoint uh, who have a last name beginning with A and then use that as a, a, an outreach uh, process to go after. Am I answering your question? I, I, I want to make sure. I would like to add a couple things. So, um, I, I'm sorry, this is Kristen Baca for the record. So in the blob data that we talked about um, a couple weeks ago, within that data itself, it has an eligibility process to it. And it holds data, so once it hits the Fed, um, Fed Hub, it brings back data and it says how they're eligible. We can use that as an example, use that data to see um, once they've selected throughout the process and a plan, then we can, we can run this report and see where they've uh, become in the system. Lynn Atkins for the record. So I get that we can run a report. I, I guess I'm trying to go through basics. What we, we seem to have this just fundamental breakdown from the beginning of it, it should be so easy to use the website and sign up and get insurance. So if someone, um, if we decide again, everyone with the last name of the letter A, if, if uh, Mary Brown gets on the website on April 2nd and tries to enroll, is the system going to say, aha, we recognize that your last name's with the letter B and therefore you're not able to, you have to wait for open enrollment period, and therefore also would it allow, you know, John Anderson say, aha, we recognize that your last name's letter A, you, you are part of our selected group, you may go forward and finish your process. I don't see how the system is going to do that unless it's pure, unless people are only able to use brokers, navigators, or the call center. And we're talking again, I haven't heard kind of a narrowing of this group. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people that we're going to reach out to. So again, I am completely supportive of getting as many people signed up as possible. That's not, that my, my questions are not against any of that. I just, I don't hear how the system is going to support any of this. And I apologize, uh, Ms. Atkins, uh, Greg Bidiello again. Um, to some degree, I'm struggling to, to be able to give you the answer because it, uh, the question that you're asking in your example, um, our system is not designed to do that, okay? Um, clearly stated. Um, what our system is designed to do and what we've been working to do is to make sure that anyone who does come into the system and wishes to apply, that we are making the system um, easier for folks to use and are able to get through the entire eligibility process up to the point of making a plan selection and then uh, making a payment so they can eventually get on with the carriers and, and hopefully begin receiving benefits. And so when I think about a special enrollment period, what I think about is we're opening up the time period for additional folks to get in and what we've been working towards for 331 We've been working down the priority defects that were out there that were preventing people from getting through. As you've heard testimony today from various, from the various brokers and, and others, um, we are making improvements there. People are able to get through. And the purpose here is to try to figure out, in, in my mind, is we get more people through. Do we have the capacity to do it? The answer is yes. And, and the additional time will hopefully yield more people getting it. This is Marie Kerr. Um, Mr. Aiello and Ms. Baca, um, I don't think we've heard a response to Ms. Johnstone's question, and excuse me if I rephrase it incorrectly, can we tell the last date that someone attempted to complete enrollment? Um, if you don't know the answer to the question, um, is it possible for us to table this item for about 30 minutes so you guys can go back and call in and figure out if you can get us an answer? Absolutely. So for that for that specific question, you are correct. We would we can go back and get an answer to that question and come back to you guys. Madam Chair, this is Leslie Johnstone. Um, I would also like to know exactly how many people got stuck at, after they selected their plan. And if you could uh, timeline it for us, how many uh, got to that point in the last 30 days 
and haven't been able to submit a new application and get through the process? How many got that um, stuck uh, got stuck at that point in the last 60 days and have not since submitted another application? Madam Chair, I would just like to say, uh, do you fully understand when it's not an open enrollment, but as Lynn has been saying, a, a special enrollment, which would require certain filters or special reports from you. So while you're talking to the team, do they fully understand what we're trying to achieve just to find out if it's capable of doing what we want to do? Do you have any questions to fully understand what we're asking that we need you to be able to do, that it will be just selected people that have had problems with the program to allow them the opportunity to complete the process. So yes, Dr. Jamison, I, I understand the request. What would be helpful to us in being able to come back with a definitive answer is having a better understanding of exactly which populations you wish for us to consider. Because in order for me to, to be able to answer you truthfully and be able to provide you uh, with the right information so you can make a decision, I need to know which group you're going after. So are you talking with regard to the time period or more specifically where they were in the process and when, it, uh, when they got stopped? So I'll answer your question by asking you the question, basically saying I, I would need to but know both. This is Dr. Ford. So according to the um, interim director's report, there's approximately 100,000 people who, who uh, got an eligibility determination, qualified health plan either with or without an APTC, and then confirmed plan selections, uh, it's 30,000. So it sounds like the board needs to decide at what level which group we allow to go forward. It sounds like that's the issue. Madam Chair, this is Leslie Johnstone. As one board member, I would be focused on the group that made a planned selection and got stuck because I think there were a lot of shoppers in here wanting to just look around and see what the costs were and um, didn't necessarily intend to make a final decision. So for purposes of discussion, that would be the group I would think about. It's those that made a planned selection and then got stuck in the system. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, Dennis Belcourt, Deputy Attorney General. <clears throat> I, may, I thought it, I would offer something that would help the discussion a bit. Just <clears throat> uh, Damon, uh, Mr. Haycock referred to this in his presentation. Uh, the 60-day event, 60-day uh, period, that the open enrollment, you know, is set for is demonstrates, you know, a special circumstance. That is something that I think people are wrestling with here. Uh, any of these categories, again, the 60-day limitation is the person has a triggering event, which is you know, you know, it might be debatable whether if you have a, if you go on every day and try to advance your application along, is each and every day a triggering event, or is, or is the, um, and then when you quit, is that is that the final triggering event? Uh, that can be discussed. Um, so when we talk about uh, that, that's going to possibly limit the population of, you know, it's it's not it's not maybe easy to determine what the population is based on those terms. But it could limit the population uh, that you have to concern yourselves with. Um, just wanted to mention that. If I might, uh, um, Commissioner Kipper. On this issue, and we would be prepared to come back at the board meeting next week and provide some direction or, or some recommendation. Uh, or suggestions or options uh, for the board to to consider. Madam Chair.
Chair Lynette, can I, I, I have two questions. Um, open enrollment right now ends March 31st, but don't people have till April 15th to, no, it's when you enroll by uh, March 31st. When does that, don't you have by April 15th? That starts May 1st, okay. I'm thinking of it. So, that's right, that's right. Thank you very much. Dr. Ford was just clarifying that for me. Um, I, I guess my question is, um, and I think, yes, we need to figure out what group we're talking about. Ms. Johnstone and Dr. Ford, I think, are, are it, it's, it, it sounds like everyone's kind of this smaller population of folks who have selected plans. Isn't the big glitch in the system, though, the payment system? So, If we kind of get, tell everyone you have 30 days or whatever, I think we can choose up to 60 days, right? If we tell everyone in this in this population you have 30 days to pay, isn't that the piece of this that just the one of the pieces of that's just not working? And and people, so again, I I continue to just want to make sure whatever we decide, whatever group this is, that we're not then having weekly meetings, having Xerox before us saying. This whole group, they can't get through. They send their payments in. Nobody's opening up the mail. We're getting all these faxes. We're trying to pay. It. On this issue, and we would be prepared to come back at the board meeting next week and provide some direction or, or some recommendation uh, or suggestions or options uh, for the board to, to consider. Chair Lynette, can I, I, I have two questions. Um, open enrollment right now ends March 31st, but don't people have till April 15th to, no, it's when you enroll by uh, March 31st. When does that, don't you have by April 15th? That starts May 1st, okay. I'm thinking of it. So, that's right, that's right. Thank you very much. Dr. Ford was just clarifying that for me. Um, I, I guess my question is, um, and I think, yes, we need to figure out what group we're talking about. Ms. Johnstone and Dr. Ford, I think, are, are it, it's, it, it sounds like everyone's kind of this smaller population of folks who have selected plans. Isn't the big glitch in the system, though, the payment system? So, If we kind of get, tell everyone you have 30 days or whatever, I think we can choose up to 60 days, right? If we tell everyone in this in this population you have 30 days to pay, isn't that the piece of this that just the one of the pieces of, that's just not working? And and people, so again, I I continue to just want to make sure whatever we decide, whatever group this is, that we're not then having weekly meetings, having Xerox before us, saying. This whole group, they can't get through. They send their payments in. Nobody's opening up the mail. We're getting all these faxes. We're trying to pay. It. Process yet, um, but we are working for a way to be able to take that payment over the phone uh, with the consumer. Um, working with our banking institutions now uh, to see if we can implement something. There are considerations from a security standpoint to be able to implement that. So while it's technologically feasible uh, to quickly do it, I'm working through uh, ensuring that there are appropriate controls in place to be able to do it. Um, but the guidance that we are always giving to the consumers now is uh, if we are unable to make that payment or take it for them, we're instructing them to send it into uh, the payment lockbox and we have not had issues with, um, at, at the moment, uh, with people sending in a check and, and those going through. Madam Chair, um, this is Leslie Johnstone. <clears throat> as far as the payment problems go, it seems like it's much beyond what was just described. We've got a less than automated process getting those payments and reconciled with the carriers. So I think we need to, as a board, Keep in mind the entire system that the carriers may not recognize the payment because of the cumbersome process that currently exists. And therefore, those individuals, Xerox may think that the person has paid, but because of the cumbersome process that we have, it hasn't gotten registered with the carrier. I think we need to not forget that group as well. I think that's probably the larger group anyway. Uh, 
Madam Chair, Lynn Atkins, for the record, I, I think we need a little more information before we can vote. I think we need to figure out what this population might be, what our options are, what the numbers are. Um, I, I, I just think we need a little bit more information. Uh, do you think you'll be able to have a little caucus and be back in 30 minutes? Yes, so this is Kristen Baca for the record. So I would like to run some numbers and let's see where we're at and come back in 20, 30 minutes and then present back to you. I think that sounds reasonable and at that point in time we can figure out if we need more time after that. Okay, so why don't we close uh, this agenda item uh, for the time being. We'll reopen it, say, in 20, 30 minutes. And then, um, what time is it right now? 3.30, can you watch? Um, we've got the Xerox report. Both of you are needed for that. But let's go to the consumer assistance. Do, do board members want to take a five-minute break, or do you want to just plug along? What about in Carson City? You want to take a break or you want to keep going? I have pleasure, the chair. Okay. Well, if, if people need to leave for a few minutes, we'll understand, but we'll keep going. I know some of us here have a 6.30 flight, so I need, we, we need to kind of close this down by about quarter of five. Um, let's move on to agenda item number five, which is the Consumer Advisory Committee. Vice Chair Atkins, uh, this is C.J. Bowden. Would you like to give the recommendation you have previously in the past, or would you like me to proceed with it? No, thank you, C.J. I, 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 I'm not going to read the report. If I can just give a little summary, and then maybe if if um, if you want to delve into a little bit more of the the, the weeds, I'll um, be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, that would be great. Um, Lynn Atkins, um, for the record, uh, our Consumer Assistance Advisory Committee meeting has uh, committee has met twice to discuss the role um, of the navigators and enrollment assisters because uh, all the contracts are just are ending March 31st. And all of the contracts um, and all of the numbers that were in the contracts were based again on the 118,000 people that we thought we were going to enroll. So this, this board asked the Consumer Assistance Committee to get together to discuss kind of the future of the uh, Navigator and Assister program um, and how this would go both during uh, when open enrollment ends and then also at the start of the next open enrollment period. So in very broad summary, um, our committee um, really, uh, we, we first started discussing the funding of Navigator Enrollment Assisters and if the board remembers, we had a separate uh, um, finance and sustainability subcommittee that handled all of the money part of the navigator and assister program and made recommendations to the board. Our group did not discuss that. We started discussing that and kind of got mired down in in the detail about that and and finally came to the recommend uh, to the realization at our last meeting that we are not the group that should be focusing on the funding of the navigators and sisters. So we really narrowed our conversation on what is we want to have happen to this group where the contracts are ending March 31st. Part of the discussion today is if we are going to have a special enrollment period for um, any group of people, whatever it is, um, I would guess many of the navigators and enrollment assisters will need to help facilitate that process to get those folks enrolled. So I, I think that's kind of a uh, no-brainer that we need to continue on with these entities during that time. Um, the question arises what to do with these group of folks who have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours figuring out the system, getting people in, doing outreach, relationships, and really in a lot of ways have a lot more expertise um, on the system than a lot of folks at the call center. They've been consi consistent um, and, and fearless and doing everything they can along with the brokers um, and agents to get as many people enrolled. What our concern is, is that we eliminate this program during, once open enrollment ends, and assuming, as I will assume, that this system is going to be up and working functionally the way it's supposed to um, in November for the next open enrollment period, we now have lost all of our 
in uh, all of our knowledge. We've lost all the people that kind of know how to work this system and, and know how to get people enrolled. And that does not make um, sense to our group based, uh, and, and it's not a good use of resources, we do not think. Um, we don't want to have a brain drain of all of that talent and understanding of the system to get people enrolled. So this group, um, my committee is recommending to the board that we maintain in some capacity, we don't know what that capacity is, but we maintain the Navigator Enrollment Assister uh, program. When open enrollment ends, um, they will both continue to um, enroll people with qualifying life events. We will be able to um, have them uh, still assist people who are the overflow, especially if we do a special enrollment session, continue to help people to keep, continue to be supported by the exchange and get ready for the next open enrollment session. Um, we've seen the numbers of people that are hitting that website. We see the number, the, you know, this past week, what was it, 100,000 new unique visitors to the website? I think there's going to be pent up demand for people that had really frustrating experience that are going to be ready to go at the next open enrollment period. And we need to have these navigators and enrollment assisters who know what they're doing. We need to have them ready. We need to have the appointments scheduled. I think Ms. Ellis talked about that they had appointments ready once open enrollment opened. We need to have their boots on the ground and we need to have them ready. So our recommendation to the board is that we maintain the navigator and enrollment assister program um, effective past the March 31st deadline and all the way through the next open enrollment period. And it's my, it's our understanding that the next open enrollment period has been extended now to February 15th. So we believe that we need to have this group of folks um, under contract April 1st to February 15th. And we would ask that the board um, be able to pay for it. Madam Chairman, I would like to just agree uh, with Ms. Atkins, uh, I just think that these navigators are are doing an incredible job, and the expertise in getting uh, in understanding the process, not just of the computer, but when they're the not just the health link and the software, but of understanding and learning, which many of them do not know in the very early part the different insurance plans, and although they're never allowed to sway a person, but need to be able to educate them because they're not brokers. So their education both on the health plan uh, software, the, the link, both in their experience of learning to answer the complicated questions about the various insurance programs, to try to re-educate another group is just an onerous task and to lose all these people who have done such uh, an incredible job. I think it's just a matter of months before we're up and running again. I don't think there's any way we could possibly uh, start all over again and expect to have people on the ground running and be able to do the efficient job we need to do. Do we have comments from up in Carson City? Marie Kerr, um, I like the idea of extending it. You know, there certainly is a value to having persons who are who have the experience and who know what they're doing. Um, the big question I would have for staff is, can we afford it? And if we can't afford it, are we going to be diverting resources from elsewhere that are needed um, elsewhere? So with that, I'd um, like staff to answer those questions. Thank you. For the record, Damon Haycock, um, the payment to enrollment assisters and navigators comes out of two separate buckets of funds, as we've mentioned before. So the enrollment assisters were originally funded at $200,000 through our exchange level two establishment grant. Staff requested an addition of $1.1 million in change with our fourth level one establishment grant, and all of these funds have been obligated through the first open enrollment period through March 31st. There's currently no additional grant funding slated for these, these uh, enrollment assisters beyond March. If the board wishes to continue their involvement, staff can request a sixth level one establishment grant on May 15th. However, this funding will not be available to expend until approved by the Interim Finance Committee in August. Remember, any grant funds requested must be expended by December 31st of this year. There will be no grant funding available whatsoever for enrollment assisters beyond December 31st. As far as navigators, these uh, must be funded by exchange operating funds. 
The exchange collects per member per month fees that began in January. All fees collected so far have gone to pay current navigator obligations, and for the next few months, those fees are needed to settle all navigator outstanding bills. The exchange can then begin to utilize per member per month fees to pay navigators again. Please remember that the exchange must collect enough fees to maintain a reserve going into 2015, or we will not be able to survive the first month when grant funding ends. Standard costs, like payroll, automatically come out, and we need a minimum of 30 days reserve to ensure we seamlessly transition between grant funding and per member per month fee revenue. Our calculations indicate that with the current level of enrollment, approximately $500,000 will accrue through December of this year to put towards navigators. So is there $500,000 which is available, some portion of that? And I think that, as Lynn said, if it's possible, we would then get into the discussion of how much uh, next and to whom, which navigators it may go to. So for the record, Damon Haycock, that $500,000 will be the cumulative amount of funding if not spent by the end of December. And so we receive uh, per member per month fees, roughly $5 per month per enrollee. So you realize we have about 21,000 folks. So about $100,000 comes in every month, uh, but we still have to satisfy remaining navigator funds. And then we could start drawing down against those. Also, please recognize we spent approximately $1.2 million of uh, funding, both grant uh, and, na and navigator funding. Uh, to supply the navigator entities with their current budgets only through the month of January. So this doesn't even c cover February or March. There are different opportunities and options on how to fund the navigators, which, as Ms. Etkins has mentioned, can be discussed at another committee or directly with the board. Uh, there are different opportunities to pay specifically for enrollment or to provide a, a small amount of, of fixed costs and then pay variable costs according to their, their progress but none of these have been completely vetted or brought to any committee or board as of yet. Let me ask a question of the board members. Um, I think what I'm hearing is philosophically the board would like to see this program continued. Um, if that is the case, do you want to direct staff to create a plan for our review so that we can review it to see how feasible it is, and that would give staff opportunity of telling us what the upside and the downside is to going down that path. Because I, I, I agree with you, Ms. Atkins, um, losing that talent pool is not a good idea, but how to fund it, you know, is, is the problem right now. Ms. Dr. Ford, I Dr. Ford, you cut out? I cut out, but I'm back in. Uh, I'm missing a fundamental of this discussion. I understand we all want to be good stewards of the per member per month monies, but isn't there an inherent down uh, slow period for these navigators? So are we talking about a retainer um, for the downtime, which is going to be in the spring and summer? At some sort of retainer so they don't go somewhere else and then again giving them more money when they're actively actively scheduling so it's just a practice about for the record I, I think we need to have that discussion one of the things that um, was was again my committee was trying to stay away from the funding discussion because that's not what we were designed for but I think if if fundamentally you say well, during the downtime, you will just be paid, let's say, for how many people you enroll. You're going to lose all of your navigators and enrollment assisters because there's, we're talking about qualifying life events and you don't have, you're not going to have, or, or at least we don't know. I think we asked staff, we don't know what that number, that number might be. Um, right now, they're just on a, they're on a contract. They're on a grant. And it isn't based on how many people they're enrolling. It's, it's just based on we expect and hope that you enroll. And again, all of those target numbers were based on the 118,000 that we thought we were going to get. So I think, especially during the down period, we should um, have a similar grant for these organizations to continue doing what they're doing to work with the people. If we have the special enrollment session to um, assist people who have the qualifying life events and to still be 
um, what, on retainer or on grant. I think we need to do that. I think as we looked and Shauna prepared um, some information based on the current grantees, um, my guess is we wouldn't need to use all the grantees again. Some of them are more productive than others, and so I think we would look at that um, and, and definitely compare it down. But I don't think one of the, um, I don't think a realistic option is to say um, we will continue this program, but we're just going to pay you, pay you based upon how many people you enroll because I just think you're going to, you're going to lose everybody and, and that's just not workable. Um, and I think, um, you know, do we have the money? I think we have to find the money. I think we have to have the money. I think we've got to figure out a way. I think we should absolutely, um, I would hope staff is going to be applying for these level six grants or, or whatever it is for um, any, any exchange operations, including the enrollment assister program. Um, but uh, I, I, my, my fear is that, um, my hope is that the technology piece gets fixed and that we are open for business and 100,000 people come that first day. My fear is that's going to happen and our navigator program is going to collapse. And we will have done that to ourselves. And so I don't think that is an option. And uh, I, although it cost uh, over a billion at the first grant when everything was partialed out, because I think probably there will be fewer recipients of grant, those were that were most successful, that will reduce the amount we need. And in addition, the startup cost in their original grants had computer hardware and much else, so we won't have to give them as much. However, we can't, as Lynn said, just give them per enrollee, because they're going to be doing uh, very little numbers that, that they could never survive on. However, they do hope to do shop, which uh, are uh, all the different populations um, Ms. Ellis talked about that could be very large numbers in the small businesses and could add up phenomenally. And in addition, besides doing small businesses, just like the uh, period prior to enroll, uh, new enrollment, last time they, they went out and did, she said, oh my goodness, uh, maybe she can remind us, but she did something like 53 events because they are doing education and outreach. Education is paramount, and we can't use that, lose the education and outreach, which is a critical portion. It's always hard to say how much money do we get for that, but that's very important to continue now. I would make a recommendation that let's see if the board wants to continue this program, and then we direct staff back to come back with a, a suggested financial plan for us. Oh, this is Dr. Ford, I so move. I second that motion, Florence Jameson. Any further discussion among board members? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. And then staff, um, I don't know if you can do it by next meeting or maybe the meeting thereafter. Uh, but if you'll help develop a financial plan to see how we can continue this valuable program. Thank you to the board and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do think we are in a little bit of a time crunch, as always, because all of these grants expire March 31st. So um, I think the board's going to probably need to make a decision prior to that for something to be implemented uh, for April 1st. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we're down to the Xerox report and then going back to item, well, let's go to the uh, item number eight, which is the action uh, of any potential BDRs for the next legislative session. And who is going to lead that? Damon Haycock. Yes, for the record, Damon Haycock. Uh, there are uh, potential changes that can be made to the Nevada Vice statutes that uh, decide how the exchange operates, our NRS 695I. The purpose of this report is to provide with information, of course, and recommendations regarding that process. This is a pretty quick one. I know we're short on time, so I'm going I'm to kind of paraphrase. Uh, state agencies have the ability to request changes every biennium uh, through a bill draft request process, and there's two forms. There's basic housekeeping where you change some verbiage, uh, and then there's other major substantive uh, BDRs where you actually are trying to implement your new budget. As an example, if we wanted to offer a whole new slew of products, which we know we can't, 
Mr. Kipper, but if, as an example, if we wanted to, and that was going to increase the state's budget, we'd have to submit a, a formal long budgetary uh, BDR. And so basically, a couple of dates to keep in mind. Uh, if if the board has, has the time and inclination to go through all of the Nevada Revised Statutes governing the board, there isn't too many. I put a table, and it's linked, so if you actually have it electronically, it's a lot faster. But uh, if we need to make any specific changes to language only, those housekeeping type of bill draft requests, the budget division at the Department of Administration is requiring them to be done by May 16th, which is why we brought it to you at this board meeting to ensure that you had ample time to review those, uh, those uh, NRSs and get back to staff so that way we can develop the bill draft request for your approval and then submit it through the process. If indeed there are some some larger sweeping budgetary type of bill draft requests, those are not due to the budget division until August 29th. And so there are uh, there is significantly more time to develop and to vet those and to flesh those out. And so what again what we wanted to recommend is that if you uh, if you know of any non-budgetary requests that uh, that you provide them to staff uh, by May 16th, or or it, to be honest, actually sooner than that by April 15th, so we have time to, to submit them through the necessary channels and through the process on the, on the online entry system. And that we are also requesting if you have budgetary changes to statute, uh, that we receive those by May 15th. So again, we have enough time to develop the appropriate bill draft request to bring back to you for approval. Uh, we recommend that if, uh, if you, that you decide if there are any proposed non-budgetary requests to NRS 695I, if there are any proposed budgetary requests, and provide us with any direction if any decisions above are yes. And of course, if this is too fast and too early, you have time to provide us that direction later. Mr. Haycock, I don't think you're expecting any comment or suggestions right at this point, but just giving us a deadline, is that correct? Madam Chair, that is correct. Just wanted to, to give everybody a heads up that this is coming down the pipe and that if we need to make decisions or the board wants to make decisions, we will need to start doing that process sooner than later. You know, uh, there were a couple of BDRs uh, that we proposed last year uh, or at last session and I think one of it was expanding into the area of vision and I'm not sure, but it might be helpful to the board if you sent those uh, BDRs uh, did not make it out of committee and, and just see if that's something that uh, the board wants to look at again. We uh, will do, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes. I, I think it'll take him some time to gather that information and just send it out to us. Um, Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Haycock, is that clear to you that you can email that to us as soon as you get it? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And is there a possibility that someone from Xerox could start their presentation now? And if, if, okay, let's take just a two-minute break while we check and see if Xerox is about ready to give the presentation.
We've got a quorum, and I'm going to bring this back and move on to agenda item number nine, uh, just to make sure that we've got that. Uh, are there any uh, requested agenda items for our future meeting? We've got our weekly meeting for the Xerox report again next Thursday, which is the okay, will be the twentieth. Um, but. And, and during the conversation today, we've directed staff to bring things back next week or the following week. But are there any other items that board members would like to see staff uh, produce for us? Okay. Then the weekly meetings will continue for the Xerox reports. And our normal meeting like we're having today is on the second Thursday of every, of every month. So I think that takes care of that item. We've done that. Um, this was item number nine. Dennis, help me. If we had public comment now, is it appropriate, or do we have to have it as the last closing? You may oh. have it now. Okay, we've got Xerox here. All right, why, why don't you, can you answer the questions now or do you want to do the report? Are you waiting for uh, Ms. Baca to come back? Uh, I, I'll answer the question. Okay. And then, and then we'll go through the report. Okay. So again, Greg Vidiello for the record. So we went back and, and you know, considering your request. Um, so again, uh, to address Ms. Ekin's question earlier, um, there are filters in the system per se to be able to uh, limit um, the entry point as you had suggested by a name or whatever filter we would come up with. So, so I, I don't necessarily think that that would be the right approach here. Um, what we did go back to the team is you know, we know that people did get stuck at various points in the system. And I believe what we are able to do is identify that population, uh, identify when and where they got stuck in the process. So working with you, we can define, you know, which of those people we wish to go after based on, um, you know, what their, what their intent was to move forward. And, and then to address Ms. Johnstone's uh, question, um, we also um, would be able to go back and look, you know, look at those who got stuck as part of the plan selection uh, process. And once we ident and I don't have that specific number of individuals uh, at the moment that would affect or who we would be going after, what I would like to be able to do is go through, make sure we're looking at an unduplicated count, because as we discussed earlier, there are people who have tried to submit applications several times in the process. So we would like to be able to go through and make sure we're, we're going after you know, a single you know, application. Um, and then as a suggestion, um, we would suggest working you know, with the navigators and with the brokers uh, assuming we go forward with the special enrollment period and set up a special team within Xerox as well to handhold and focus on these folks that we are trying to get through the process. And uh, I think that would be our greatest chance of success, um, even if it means us, you know, sitting, you know, in with the brokers uh, or, you know, setting up, you know, something here uh, to be able to do it. Um, I think that we would have the greatest success of moving forward and have some reporting out on it. Chairwoman? That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jamison. Um, as we saw in the early part of this process, when the, when the system really wasn't working well and much of it had to go to a hand process, I think that... Um, 
I'm hopeful, as you are, that the health link is really working great. But I think we're going to, in order to see this through, we're going to need to kind of go back to the basics, like not using the computer and selecting out running reports and using a new team to contact these people. But my feeling is, with um, Mr. Uh, Kipper making some recommendations for some guidelines for a select population, and the insurance company, uh, the letter that you wrote from the association s seems to be uh, comfortable with this. And our whole goal is to insure as many people and give them access to health care. I feel that even if we err on being overconfident that we can do this, it's better to give the opportunity to these people who have wrestled and failed in the system, one more opportunity to get through. So I would like to move. Quick comment, I'm gonna to need to leave. Um, I just wanted to go on records to state that I think it was three weeks ago, I asked Xerox to provide samples of the communication outreach that they're have sent out to the target populations in these different uh, categories of folks that have not made it through. And to date, I haven't seen anything, and I would uh, appreciate a response. Thank you, Ms. Johnstone, so noted. All right, if you want to get started. Yes. The record, this is a great review from Xerox. Um, and just to answer uh, quickly Ms. Johnstone's question, uh, I believe that we actually did forward uh, those communications uh, to the exchange. And um, so we'll follow up with the exchange to ensure um, that those are forwarded to you. So good afternoon and thank you again uh, for providing Kristen and I with the opportunity to provide you with an uh, update uh, as to our progress. Uh, we will uh, follow the same format as we did last week as far as uh, reporting uh, the highlights. Um, for our, and I'll continue with our uh, highlighting our month-to-date progress, uh, discuss some of the challenges that we are still facing and, and what we are doing to actively resolve those issues and answer any questions uh, that uh, the board may have uh, following uh, my presentation. We continue on our journey uh, of stabilizing operations and, and our technical systems. Over the past week, we've seen an overall increase in enrollment. Uh, as we've previously reported, uh, we are approaching uh, and are in steady state of call center operations. Uh, we've reduced our overall correspondence inventory uh, with great success there. And we've implemented, uh, again, additional web portal improvements uh, to improve the overall consumer experience. To date, uh, there are 31,457 members who have been determined QHP eligible. Of those, 21,823 have um, made their initial premium payment and, and have, been put, have been sent to the carriers uh, through our 834 process. 9,634 of those individuals, we have selected a plan, but we are awaiting payment. And we're currently uh, outreaching to those folks in order to um, uh, encourage a payment. We've completed five of our overall enrollment campaigns. Um, as we previously reported, we've sent out over 109,000 uh, communications uh, to uh, to our consumers, 72% uh, of those were sent via email, and 28% or the remainder were sent through email or making outbound phone calls. As a result of our campaigns, uh, we have received uh, approximately 1,500 individuals who have contacted us expressing that they'd like to continue interest in the program, and approximately 50% of those have actually made a payment and actually uh, are are now enrolled. We've made significant progress with regard to reducing the correspondence inventory. Um, and I'd like to provide an update 
uh, beyond what was in the report that was posted yesterday. Uh, as of today, uh, we have processed 29,000 uh, pieces of correspondence um, with a remaining uh, correspondence of 3,338 that need to be touched for the first time. Based on what we receive on a daily basis, that represents approximately uh, three and a half days inventory on hand. What we are considering an acceptable inventory on hand going forward is 2,500 uh, pieces, which would represent a complete three-day period. 4,000 of the 29,000 pieces that, that we reviewed and completed for the first time um, do require some additional follow-up. And, and, um, and to Ms. Ekin's point earlier, represent uh, some of the special case uh, issues that we uh, need further resolution to. And, and the types of things and categories that, that they fall into, people who ident were identified as having billing or APTC issues and had contacted us uh, for the purpose of trying to help them resolve. Um, I'm also pleased to report, uh, I don't see Mr. Wilden there today, but the 2,173 applications that he had asked us about two weeks ago, we have processed all 2,173 uh, of those. Uh, I had made a commitment during last week's board meeting that there were 351 that had not been touched. We're sorry, we your conference is ending now. Please hang up. I'll continue. Um, I made a promise uh, to the board that we would complete those uh, on Friday of last week, which we did do, and uh, we've assigned the staff to make sure uh, that we continue to follow up on any of those folks who were missing additional information and uh, to make sure that they can complete it all the way through. Now I'd like to talk uh, briefly uh, about the carriers. And um, as late as yesterday, uh, we had met with the carriers. Uh, we have a, a weekly call with them, and we heard loud and clear the frustrations um, that, and concerns that they continue to express. We recognize that we're not uh, where we need to be or want to be yet, and, uh, but we are committed to continuing to work with them uh, to resolve all of the outstanding issues and ensure that our processes are working appropriately. In order to ensure that success, um, we are um, going to follow many of the same strategies that we've employed to, to uh, fix the call center, to reduce the inventory backlogs by putting uh, the appropriate level of staffing and working with the exchange to ensure that we have the appropriate people there and, and, get, and that their issues get the appropriate focus so we can resolve and make sure that the process is flowing smoothly. From a technology standpoint, I'd like to just provide the update that we've completed 161 of the 182 uh, priority one, priority two defects, um, which represents approximately 88% of those. Uh, and we are on track to meet our commitment for 331 and completing the remainder. This week, you'll notice I've included a new report on lower priority defects that are out there in, uh, residing within the system. Uh, there were a total of 109 of those. Uh, these are one. These are defects that are not affecting consumers' ability to get through the portal. Um, they are lower-level items that, that, just for the purposes of transparency, want you to be aware are out there, and we're on track to complete those by April 10th. Again, these are not ones that are affecting people's ability to get through. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, open up to any questions that the board may have. Let me ask a question uh, to the board members. I had asked uh, yesterday that you put together a short written report uh, dealing with some of the carrier issues. And that, uh, I got my copy about noon. I'm not sure if everyone's got their emails. You may want to open and see if, I think Damon sent it out to all the board members and we'll get this posted online later today. Um, but I've been listening in on the carrier calls for several months now and the, 
transfer of information on the 834s and the 820s still needs to be resolved. But one of the bigger issues that I think the carriers are struggling with is that reconciliation process. Um, do you want to talk about that uh, a little bit so that some of the board members that aren't listening in on that are a little more knowledgeable on that issue? Certainly. Um, as everyone's aware and as everyone's been hearing, um, either through the brokers or through the carriers, um, there have been concerns uh, as far as when we say somebody's enrolled and whether or not the carrier believes that that person uh, is enrolled and ultimately if that person has received a member card. While we don't have control over uh, whether the person receives the member card, we do have control over ensuring that anybody that we say is enrolled actually is represented on the carrier's uh, system. Uh, we've been uh, working with the carriers on a weekly basis uh, and, and have been putting in uh, and refining our reconciliation processes uh, and meeting uh, with the carriers both individually uh, as well as in a group setting um, to, uh, to go through um, and essentially reconcile what we show uh, in our membership uh, system versus what they're showing on their membership system. Um, we are also right now in the process of testing uh, the change file which support the qualified life event uh, Items. Um, to date, I just want to give a, an update on where we are with those. Um, we have, uh, we're in the process of completing the termination uh, test file. Um, we have successfully completed testing with two of the medical carriers and two of the dental carriers. Um, there are five other carriers that we're still in the process of testing. And uh, one of the dental carriers that we're working with has indicated they're not prepared uh, for um, uh, testing at the moment. We are now turning our attention towards uh, testing of reinstatements to the change files, and uh, we expect that process to begin next week. From a reconciliation standpoint, uh, we have begun a manual reconciliation and providing uh, for the ACH versus the 820 uh, disbursement file. The eight, just so everyone's clear as I'm speaking about the numbers of files, the 834 file is what we use to actually transmit uh, those who are members and the 820 is uh, the file that indicates the payment. And then ACH file is uh, how we actually transmit the funds from what we receive from from our clients. So what a new process that was put in place as of last Wednesday and has been in place every day, uh, we're ensuring that we are reconciling uh, the 820 disbursement file to the ACH funding file that's being sent on, on a daily basis. And identifying any of those discrepancies uh, for the carriers uh, so it will make it easier for them to uh, reconcile their membership. Do you have any further questions? No, this, this seems to be a continuing issue. And realistically, when do you think that reconciliation process is, I mean, that's always going to be an ongoing issue. But right now, we've got a real backlog in it. And when do you think realistically that Xerox is going to get the carriers caught up in current? And, and then you deal with the normal day-to-day -day reconciliation problems. I mean, I, th I think this has been one of the big hot points for the carriers. So, again, I, I, you know, I think we're working very hard to try to do that. Um, to, I, I'm hesitant to give you an exact date um, as to when everything will be fully reconciled uh, in meeting with you know, our teams and, and continuing to meet with uh, the carriers, I would say, uh, honestly, uh, uh, by mid-April, we should be in a place where um, the membership should be reconciled between uh, the carriers and Xerox. Thank you. 
Do any of the board members have any questions on any of these reports? Ms. Kerr? No, thank you. Barbara, we're losing you again. Uh, I, I'm just checking with the board members here. Uh, I don't think anyone has well, questions. Only to say I'm, I'm glad that we're seeing some good progress going on here with regard not to the insurance, but the earlier half of the report with regard to the other issues. All right. Uh, thank you for your report then. I think that brings us to public comment again. And can we have a show of hands in Carson City on public comment? None. And how about here in Henderson? We've got one. Okay. If you want to come forward. For the record, Lou Silla, a broker here in Nevada. Uh, just reg regarding the uh, board's uh, upcoming decision on uh, the selection of who's going to be available, uh, many of you know that one of the main uh, sticking points for the first four months of uh, enrollment was sign and submit. It's where you kind of acknowledge everything you just put in, and that's when you got that un unresolvable error message. So many, many people did not have the chance to select the plan. So to use the basis of those people that have had selected a plan and eliminate everybody else, I think is a bit unfair to the public. I also think that you can easily get caught up in what ifs and what if this happens and if that happens. And also to try and put the uh, Xerox up against the wall to reinvent the wheel to get through this process. Since you've already acknowledged that you're gonna keep the uh, navigators and enrollment people on board and you have the broker community uh, Mr. Vidiello suggested that you use as the final filter that group to make sure the processes go through. And I would hope that the board considers that as an option and not so quickly eliminate uh, any particular categories. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment here? All right, Ms. Sexton. Madam Chair, someone um, handed me a, a letter in a um, uh, um, uh, envelope filled with copies for all the board members if you want to hand it out and ask if I would read this into the uh, record, so if I may do that. This is from um, Senator Harry Reid. It says, to members of the board, the intent of the Affordable Care Act is to ensure that all Nevadans and all Americans have the safety and security of quality affordable health insurance coverage, and we are seeing the realization of this goal in many places throughout the country. The federal exchange, despite its initial problems, has now enrolled 2.6 million Americans in qualified health plans. Other states running their own exchanges like Connecticut, California, Kentucky, and Washington are proof that the Affordable Care Act is working as intended. In total, 4.2 million people have enrolled in private health insurance plans because of the Affordable Care Act. Unfortunately, because of the failures of Nevada HealthLink's contractor Xerox, hundreds of thousands of Nevadans will be unable to benefit from the stability and financial security that health insurance coverage is providing to those to others throughout the nation. Since the start of open enrollment in October 1st, 2013, I have heard from hundreds of constituents who have had trouble enrolling in the exchange. I have received calls and letters from desperate Nevadans with nowhere else to turn. These constituents have spent hour after frustrating hour trying to get past error messages, incorrect tax credit calculations, and enrollment in just in the wrong plans. I understand that you are working diligently to have a functioning health insurance exchange. I remain willing to assist the board in any way possible to help ensure more Nevadans can gain access to health insurance coverage Please let me know how I can be of assistance. I appreciate your time and attention to this matter. Sincerely, Harry Reid, United States Senator. And so we would ask that that be posted on the website. And I think I also saw there was a couple other public comments on the website that um, I don't think anyone's come to testify about, but maybe just acknowledge that, that there are two on the website as well. There are two that I didn't see earlier. One is from Lines, L-I-N-N-E-S, Chester. And the other is from Nevada Advocates for Planned Parenthood Affiliates. And I, don't, as I read into the record the one that I was given, and you just read into the record. So I think that completes the public comment. You're falling off. Sorry, Barbara. I, I'm sorry. 
in language. Anyway, uh, we, we have four public comments then that were in written format. So if there is no other public comment, either in Carson or here in Henderson, we will adjourn the meeting until 12 noon next Thursday, and that, that will be our short Xerox update and should have further information um, about the special enrollment period. So with that, I thank everyone. I thank staff. I know you've been working your heart out lately with all these uh, weekly meetings, and please know that it doesn't go unnoticed with all the board members. We really appreciate you, and thank you so much.